Hey, welcome back to my video series about the top five choices in different categories in the Ninth Age. And this week we're going to look at large beasts. So this will be the top five of large beasts in Ninth Age fantasy battles. Um, the number five of this list to kick off with is going to be the Demon Legion Hoarders. And the Demon Legions, we might see them a bit more often in this list because the book is just crammed with different choices that are large beasts. So we might see some more of these. Um, well then into the choice so number five demon legion hoarders why the hoarders well they're really tanky for the points that you pay for them with four eight points each at a defensive of five with resilience of five um and then obviously the Aegis because it's well it's a demon unit um, and they are really grindy with the tightening grasp special rule uh, giving them grind attacks um, that basically improve every round of combat that you are in combat with them um, this makes it such that I think you would preferably play big units of these guys. However, small units are also still, I mean, in three guys of these, um, it's still 12 hit points. Um, at Resilience 5 with a 5 of Vegas for 270 points, which is also quite a steal. Um, yeah, so if you make a big unit out of these, they're going to run around 600, 700 points, more likely. Um, also, because this is one of the few, I believe it's the only demon unit that you can put two manifestations on, other than the characters. Um, and well, the, the manifestations that you can choose from, they're really diverse. I think the Chitinia skills at the moment at three points per model is a really good buy to get plus two armor. Um, however, it's only going to matter against uh, opponents that either have AP one or two. And it might not be the case that these guys want to go into the hoarders anyway, so it might not make too much of a difference, to be honest. Um, yeah, other choices would be the Grasping Proboscis. Proboscis. That gives you extra fill tokens. I'm not too big of a fan um, of that, but well, for certain lists, it can certainly make a difference. The Divining Snout, I'm not too much of a fan of either because, well, it's a really grinding unit. It's going to get in a place anywhere where it's uh, going to do its work. And you only have an advance of 5 inches, so that does limit you a little bit. But then the plus 2 advance range, I don't know if it's uh, going to make a big difference. And Natural Roots is really nice on a small unit. Um, if you have a bigger unit, then it shouldn't come into a position where one combat dress is going to matter too much. Smothering Coils, uh, you have plus one to wound against models with scoring, effectively taking your hoarders from strength four to strength five. And that is a big difference um, because then, you, well, your damage output just greatly improves. And then you have Mirrored Scales. Mirrored Scales is really, really good on these guys. However, that's also why it's been priced at a quite a steep price um, so that um, well their grindiness improves even further with every natural one that is rolled to hit is distributed on the attacking model's health pool. It's going to be likely that the attacking model's health pool is less grindy than your own with either a resilience that's lower or a defense while well, you're already hitting or an Aegis that's uh, not there. <laughs> so the chances that um, something will come to the hoarders and then find themselves striking against themselves, it's gonna be quite a quite a good counter to to some units such as uh, knights on the charge with their lances. Yeah, so they're really tanky. They're really grindy. They're quite cheap um, unless you put a lot of upgrades on them, obviously. Um, the only downside on these guys is that they're highly specialized, especially because they have AP0 and they have no way to improve this AP0. Um, so I have found a situation where I have played some orders myself and I um, had an opponent with a, a, um, with a baby Carnosaur. And then the Carnosaur has multiple wounds too against these guys. It has strength 6, I believe, which was enough to just get through... Um, the unit quite reliably and yeah then the unit just disappeared over like two rounds of combat <laughs> because of the multiple wins yeah so they definitely have their counters however just in general i think they're quite good um, the advance of five inches and march of 10 is being mitigated by the fact that they're large beasts um yeah i think that that's quite a solid choice however the only downside that they have is that against cavalry they don't really have a lot of uh, potential and cavalry is usually the the class that uh, large beasts 
struggle a bit more against because they don't get their stomp against cavalry. Um, so that might be a little bit of an issue for them. Then my number four pick is going to be a pick that I personally really like. Um, it's the Blazing Glory. So this, I think it used to be like a Demon Prince in uh, former days. Uh, it has a defensive stat line that certainly reminds you of a Demon Prince and an offensive stat line that uh, does the same. So you have five hit points uh, with a defensive and offensive that change during the game. You have a resilience of five and an Aegis of five up, which is just decent. You have five attacks at strength five, AP five actually, and agility five. So it's uh, to me it really feels like a hero more than a uh, uh, special choice, basically. Um, and then you have some uh, manifestations you can choose, and it has a special rule that it is a falling star. Um, so the model's offensive and defensive skill are twice the model's current number of health points. So you start off with offensive and defensive 10, which is <laughs> extremely high, of course. Um, and this also makes it a bit of a uh, luck-dependent piece. Because once you take some um, some wounds, so you go down to 3 hit points, then you're going to be at offensive defensive 6, which is still fine. However, a lot of enemies are suddenly going to hit you on a 4+, plus instead of uh, maybe the 6+, plus that they started out with. And then once you go down even further, um, once it only has one wound left, it only has offensive two either. So your five attacks are not going to hit on two pluses anymore, but they're going to hit on fours. And then the damage output of your guy is is suddenly quite a bit lower. Yeah, yeah. And the option uh, of uh, going for a fly option is is quite an interesting one. So the model itself comes in at 290 points, and that is quite a fair price, I think. The fly upgrade is 60 points, so that is quite expensive, putting it at 350 points. Um, however, it does mean that the chaffing this piece is way more difficult, and you can just leave it um, somewhere in your lines, basically, uh, behind some standard um, models, and then charge out whenever you want. That makes it really good, um, because also if you fill your charge, then you're just going to bump into your own unit. It combines quite well with Cloven Hooves. Cloven Hooves, I believe, used to be like 10 points or so, and now uh, the upgrade is 25 points, and rightly so, because the impact hits, they do really help the Blazing Glory in, in some matchups. Um, the only downside here is that the impact hits are resolved with the AP2 and not the AP of the model, because that would be amazing. Um, some other manifestations that might be interesting, I don't know, the brimstone secretions could be interesting, but then again, you don't see too many divine attacks either. Um, the horns of hubris I don't really value highly because it's only Vanguard 6 inches, so you, in the end, in total with your march, you're going to arrive at 22 inches, which is not really enough, I would say. Um, however, you can combine it with flies so you don't have any uh, units standing in between you. Um, stiff upper lip, yeah, it's it's mostly geared towards matchups that you don't really want to be engaged in, and with such a highly mo mobile unit, you're not going to make a lot of use of, of it, I think. Uh, then we still have the bronze backbone, um, you gain hatred. First round of combat's not really going to be an issue for you. Uh, so I don't think I would uh, go for anything other than the cloven hooves and maybe the brimstone secretions. Um, you can only take one though, um, so, but the cloven hooves are not that important that you, uh, that you have to include it on the model. I think it's a well-rounded model, it's a bit luck dependent because you can have these games where uh, you just charge it into some unit and then suddenly your opponent rolls five sixes to hit and uh, um, your blazing glory just goes down quite quickly. But it's it's really good at uh, mopping up small units. Um, it's really good at annoying people, uh, clipping charges. That's uh, I think it's a really valuable model. Then for the number three pick in the list, it's going to be the Demon Legion's Bloatflies. Um, the reason why I value these higher than the other two um, is because they're a bit better at dealing with armor, even though that the AP5 of the Blazing Glory also really works. Um, so these guys, what do they have? They have two attacks at offensive five, which is really decent. At strength six, which is also really decent, and AP three. An agility of three is just average, 
Uh, they can get dexterous tentacles, and I think this is a really good upgrade on the models um, to get plus one agility, getting you to that sweet uh, agility four spot. Um, yeah, they only have two attacks. However, if you play a bit of a bigger unit, it doesn't really matter because you have normally three support attacks max anyway. So uh, compared to, for example, the Hoarders, uh, you're going to just miss out on six attacks in a unit of, of six Bloatflies and still have 12 attacks left. Um, with Offensive 5, um, I mean, it's fine. And in Demon Legions, you can also really easily get a reroll to hit. Um, now, the rule that kicks in uh, for the Bloatflies that makes them really interesting is the Acid Blood rule. So for each Fortitude save the model fails against melee attacks, the model immediately inflicts one hit with toxic attacks. Um, the funny thing here is that if you play flaming attacks against this unit, then um, this is not going to trigger because you have to uh, make the Fortitude save. And also with Lethal Strike, you're not going to uh, have to endure this process. Um, Defensive-wise, they have four wounds, which is also one of the reasons why the Acid Blood rule works, I think. They gave the, a bit of a, a defensive stat line that, that's kind of weak, but then the amount of hit points make up for it. Um, so they only have Defensive 2, Resilience of 4. Funny thing is that they only have an Aegis 5 up against magical attacks, and then otherwise they have a Fortitude 5 up safe. So if you have any flaming attacks that are not magical, then you're just going to go through the save without any problem. And then it's going to be just a unit with Defensive 2 and Resilience 4. Then it's, it's a bit of, a, of an overpriced unit, I think. However, you can still put some uh, nice upgrades on the units. So uh, we already talked about the Dexterous Tentacles. Uh, otherwise, you can go for Digestive Format to get to a Strength 7 unit. I don't think that is really necessary. Kaleidoscopic Flesh, um, it depends on the, the units you encounter. I mean, if you encounter a Flame Cannon, then you might want to have Kaleidoscopic Flesh. However, a Hard Target 1, Flame Cannon auto hits on a 2+, plus, so that's not going to help there. An Engine Jaw, uh, so the fail to Wound Rolls, you can reroll. You're already at Strength 6, so it's not that useful, I would say. And Broodmother is the one really expensive upgrade. It is worth it, maybe, on big units. Um, so every time you cause at least three health point losses, you regain three, D3 health points. At that point, with that capability, your bloat flies are about 120 points each. Um, so, and the upgrade on, on six of these guys would also be 120 points, more or less. So if you do regain four health points in the in the entire game, then you already made your points with Brute Mother in that sense. So basically, it's an extra blow fly. <laughs> I don't know if it's really worth it. Um, maybe on the smaller units, but then again, the smaller units, they don't really deal that much damage with their close combat attacks. Um, so this doesn't include Storms, it doesn't include the Acid Blood rule. I believe, at least. <laughs> so. Yeah, then uh, it's it's only the attacks you have, and you only have two attacks on your bloat fly. So it, it mostly works if you have a big unit and that is not damaged yet, and it comes into contact, and it does the three wounds that you uh, that you have to cause. I am a bit on the fence for the brute mother. If it works, it works really well. If it doesn't, then yeah, you don't get any revenue out of it. Um, so I would be more of a fan of the Dexterous Tentacles just because it's it's a bit more cheap and it really can change some matchups in your favor. Yeah, so this is going to be my uh, my number three pick. And then let's go to the number two. To me, this is going to be the Vampire Covenant Vakolak. Um, it's a bit of a different beast than uh, the ones that we saw before. I think it's most uh, akin to the... Uh, Blazing Glory that we saw before, in the sense that it's quite a mobile piece. Um, it has quite a decent damage output. It is quite resilient in its own way, and it can perform really well on its own. In Vampire Covenant, uh, that is quite a yeah, quite a, a special thing to have something that really works well on its own. Besides the Dark Coach, maybe that that also works quite well. And the Vampire Knights, they can also pull their own their weight. Um, however, if the Vampire Knights encounter something anti-armor there, 
kind of doomed. Um, so I really like the Varkalak. Uh, the only counter to the Varkalak is flaming. <laughs> if you have flaming, then this thing doesn't really work anymore. Um, so why is it so good in my opinion? It has a 16 inch march with Vanguard. So before the first turn of the of your opponent, basically, you could have a 28, 28 inch march. Um, if your opponent starts, um, well, the Varkalak is going to be one of the first things that you can deploy and then you can redeploy it within 12 inches, basically. And the 16 inch march makes it really um, just sufficiently mobile to, uh, to get in nice places. Um, yeah, this autonomous, this is a big thing within Vampire's uh, Vampire Covenant, um, that it can just perform on its own. That's, that's really nice. Offensive defensive five, and that doesn't drop down to any lower values. I think five is, is kind of the sweet spot because a lot of elite units, uh, they go to four or five. So a lot of stuff is going to hit you on fours. Uh, with, with resilience five and the fortitude four up, you're not going to take that many wounds. He only has four hit points though, um, so with some unlucky shooting, some players will be able to just completely remove it from the game in one single round. And that is uh, that is something you have to look out for with your Varkalak. Um, Vampiric 3 plus really helps on this model, and I have had countless times where the opponent is just grinding through to your Varkalak, and then the Vampiric 3 plus kicks in, and you, you're just back in the game. Um, so imagine a Varkalak just being left on, on one hit point at the end of the combat. It makes it from Pyrrhic 3 plus roll, goes to 2. Next round of combat, your opponent is a little bit crippled. You'd still dish out your damage, or at least you do one wound. You get your another Vampiric roll, and you're back on 3 hit points. This this is really amazing, and it makes it one of the, one of the best support pieces, um, at least in Vampire Covenant, and it's, it's generally just a really good support piece. Yeah, so that's going to be it for me for number two, the Varkalak. Then before we go into the number one on the list, I'm going to go for an honorable mention of the Warriors of the Dark Gods Chimera. Um, this is a really versatile piece, I feel. Um, it's it's quite a just a standard um, stat line, um, but it just works really well. Uh, so you have 5 attacks, offensive 4, which is decent, strength 5, which is decent, AP 2 is decent, A agility 4 is decent. Uh, you have 4 hit points um, with resilience 5 and armor 3. This is all just decent stuff. Um, so it's enough to, to tackle just some light units and, and just get away with it. Um, but it's also cheap enough to be able to just sacrifice it and not really care too much about it. Um, you can put wings on it. Um, I would never personally put wings on the Chimera um, if you just play it as a uh, solo piece. Uh, that, it is true that you cannot really chaff it anymore uh, quite effectively if you have put wings on it. However, you decrease your march rate to uh, 16 inches um, and you have wings. So any kind of artillery piece with clipped wings is going to give you an extra wound when it's, uh, uh, when it's damaging you. Um, so I think that the strong points of the Chimera is that it's cheap, that it has a march of uh, 20 inches and the resilience of 5 is also really welcome. Um, it has a quite decent offensive and it's just amazing just um, as a support piece um, combined with the mobility. And I mean, it, it's not immune to panic, but Discipline 8 is also going to keep you in the field a lot of times. Um, and yeah, the... Just the amount of revenue that I have taken out of Chimeras. It's, uh, I think they're really good choices. And if you haven't uh, taken them in Warriors of the Dark Gods, just without any character on it. I mean, they they already have five attacks at Offensive Force, Strength 5. So for most armies, that is already quite decent. Um, I think they are a really good pick. And then the best of the best, the number one pick for me, it's also going to be from the Warriors of the Dark Gods book. It's going to be the Feldrax. So why the Feldrax? Well, basically for the same reason as I value the Chimera quite highly, just because it does everything it does just right enough. Um, so you have a defensive stat line, which is quite decent with four hit points. Defense for four, which is just decent enough. Resilience five, which is huge. Armor two with light armor, so you have a four up armor safe. Um, and then offensively, you have three attacks with offensive four, strength five. 
AB2. That's it's all just it's all just solid. Um, agility three is could be higher, but I mean <laughs> you can't have all. You have hatred against fly. Um, I personally never built my army to specifically account for that, but it comes in handy from time to time. And they are scoring, which is also a big thing. And you have an advance of eight inches, march of sixteen. So if needed, you can just run away uh, from a crazy situation. You do get a bit of a big footprint if you put a full model uh, unit on the table, so uh, the six model unit. Um, and then you have Discipline 9 with um, Unburned. So Unburned is a bit of a uh, bifunctional rule, so you have to, to reroll successful to wound rolls against um, the Feldrax if you're flaming attacks. And also, um, if you are unburned, then you consider other models without unburned as insignificant. This is a really weird way to con to, to um, phrase the effect it has. It's basically that you have Discipline 9, which is already quite good, and you will never have to worry about any panic tests caused by units in your vicinity or fleeing through your unit. Um, as long as they are not unburned themselves. So what you see sometimes is that people um, put down like three big units of Feldrax and then put some Feldrax Elders with it. I don't really understand that because then you um, kind of play into the, the unburned rule the wrong way because then if one of these other Feldrax units flees through your Feldrax, you still have to take the panic check. Uh, sure, that Discipline 9, however, in the Wise of the Dark Gods book, you're not going to get any type of um, reroll for that unless you include a character in the unit, which I believe you could because you can just join them with, with the guy. However, the revenue of that, I don't know. I mean, they already their damage output is already uh, fine enough. And you can still give them a weapon option with either the, the Great Weapon, the Halberd, or the Paired Weapons. Um, the Halberd, I would say, is the worst choice here because you're at Agility 3, so you might as well take Great Weapons or the Paired Weapons. Paired Weapons bring you to Offensive 5 and you ignore Parry, so you're really going to go down on uh, um, on Infantry. Great Weapon also seems really nice because you still get your Resilience 5, still get your Armor 3, um, Defensive 4 also still saves you. And you have 4 hit points per piece instead of the usual 3 for uh, for large models. Yeah, so I think they bring a lot of different uh, positive things to the table. Um, and if you don't agree with me, then just try them out on the table and see <laughs> if your opinion changes after that. Yeah, this is going to be the, the top five large beast video. Um, yeah, next time we'll uh, focus on something else again. Um, so yeah, see you next week.